Welcome back to Software Engineering 2FA3, Discrete Mathematics and Applications 2. I am Bill Farmer and we're going to continue on the topic of Turing machines and computability and today we're going to talk about Turing machines, which is really the heart of this topic. Now, we're going to talk about a particular kind of Turing machine, a deterministic one-tape Turing machine. And it has the following components. It has a tape where it has a left end marker symbol, and then it can have a string here of symbols, and then it ends with spaces or blank symbols, and we have basically an infinite number of blank symbols that goes forever to the right. And we also have here a read-write head, and this can be moved along the tape. And then we have a state, Q, and this will be a member of a finite set of states, and we have a transition function. Now the tape is a two-way tape, which means this head can move back and forth. It's read and write, which means when the head's at some point, it can read what's in the uh, spot there, or it can write to that spot. And it's also semi-infinite. All that means is that the tape is infinite to the right, it's not infinite to the left. And the input string, which is in this case this right here, this is always finite. And so the tape is an unbounded, sequentially accessed memory. And our program is deterministic. It takes, if we're looking at a spot here with our read-write head, it takes the tape symbol, the state, it takes this and the state as input, and then it produces a new tape symbol, let's say B, and a new state, which I'll call P, and then it moves either this way or this way. It moves left or it moves right. That's basically how the machine works. Okay, so let's look at a formal definition of our deterministic one-tape Turing machine, which we'll uh, abbreviate as TM. It is a tuple, uh, has a nine components. The first component is capital Q. It's a finite set of elements called states. Um, capital Sigma is a finite uh, set of symbols called um, the input alphabet and Gamma is a finite it should be set here finite set of symbols called the tape alphabet and the tape alphabet includes it includes the input alphabet and then there's a special tape symbol, which is not an input symbol, called the left end marker, which we will denote like this. And then there's a special symbol called the blank symbol, which we will denote like this. And then we have a transition function, it takes a state and a symbol, and returns a state and a symbol and either left or right. And finally, we have S as a start state, T is an accept state, and R is the reject state. So actually there's one start state, one accept state, and one reject state. Now, um, we have some conditions that uh, delta must satisfy our transition function. For all P in Q, all B in our tape alphabet, uh, if we're in any state P and we're looking at the leftmost end marker, then we must go to the right and possibly change the state. And if we're uh, in the accept state T, then whatever we do, we will always remain in the accept state. And if we're in the reject state, whatever we do, we will always remain in the reject state. So 
Turing machines, you can think of them as running forever. They always run. But once they get to a accept state or a reject state, effectively they're, they're done because they will never leave that state again. Okay, so let's look at a very simple example. This is an example of a Turing machine M. It accepts this language down here, which you might recognize as a regular language. This is a very simple language. And we have four states, S, Q, T, and R. S is a start state, T is accept, R is reject. And we have two tape symbols, and we have one, uh, we have, we have uh, for, I should say, we have A and B are the input symbols. The tape symbols are A and B plus the left end marker and the blank symbol. And so let's say we were going to um, apply this to a string. Let's take something very simple. Let's say A, A, B. We will start here and we will use this. We'll start here in the in in uh, state s and so when we're in state s we're looking at this symbol we will move to the right and stay in s i should say we're in state s we're looking at this we will keep this symbol the same stay in s and move to the right and when we move to the right we will be in state s looking at a and we will stay in s we will leave A here, and then we will move to the right. And again, same thing will happen. We will move to the right. And now we're in S. We're looking at a B. We're going to change the state Q, and we'll move to the right. And we have blank symbols here. And now we're in state Q. We have a blank symbol and we go to the accept state. Uh, and so therefore we would accept this, um, this string. And notice that we're in the accept state. It doesn't matter what we do. The, the dashes here means you can put in any information. It doesn't matter. So once we're in the accept state, we always stay in the accept state. So let's take a different example. Still a very simple example. Let's say we have this and we have B. And we're going to have blank here. So we start here. We're in state S. We look at this. We're in state S. We're looking at this. We keep this here. We move here, we're still in state S. We're in state S, and we move to, to the right. And now we have a B, and what we do when we have a B, we go to state Q, and in state Q, we read an A, and now we go to the reject state. And then we continue in that reject state forever. So basically, that says that if we have this, we reject it, it's not a member of that. Okay, so that's a very simple example. Um, examples with Turing machines can be very complex because these machines are, are quite powerful. We can go back and forth on the tape. We can write down whatever we want on the tape. The tape is infinite to the right, so we have lots of space to work. So there's great power here. And as a result, if we're going to do something sophisticated with a Turing machine, the transition function is likely to be very big and complicated. Okay, so I have a question for you. A Turing machine will either accept or reject an input string. Is this statement true or false? So I'll give you a moment to think about this.
Well, welcome back. Actually, it is false because a Turing machine has three possibilities when you run it on a string. It can go to the accept, into the accept state, therefore it accepts, or it can go into the reject state, therefore it rejects, or it may never reach either the accept state or the reject state. The Turing machine just runs forever. So Turing machines have these three possibilities. Okay, so let's continue talking about Turing machines. A configuration looks like this. It has a state here. It has what's on the tape, and that will always be a string of input symbols followed by an infinite sequence of blank symbols. And then there will be a natural number n, and that will be the position where the read-write head is at. Now, this configuration describes the machine in state Q. It has contents Z, and the rewrite head is at position N. And we're going to denote configurations by Greek letters, starting at the beginning of the Greek alphabet. So in this case, alpha, beta, gamma. And the start configuration, as we've already seen, is is going to be the start configuration on a particular input X is going to look like this. This is the start state. The contents of the tape will be the left end marker. The string, we have an input. And then this infinite sequence of blank symbols. And we're going to be reading the zeroth, or this will be the first um, entry in the tape. Now we can uh, define the next configuration relation. So how do we get from configuration alpha to beta? How do we do go to the next one? It's defined as follows. If we have this configuration and we have our this in our, uh, our transition function, so we have P here looking at Zn. Zn is the nth member of this uh, string Z here. See, in this configuration, the read head, read write head is on the nth position. And if we have this transition, we're going to go to QBL. So this will change to Q. And we will replace in Z the nth, we will replace the nth position with B. And then we'll move to the left, which means we'll change the position of the read-write head to n minus 1. So that's how that works. And we have something quite similar if this is r. In that case, the read-write head is incremented by 1. And then we can define um, this relation for n steps or for any number of steps. So uh, zero steps, we go from the configuration to itself. If we're going n plus one steps, what that means is there's some way we can go n steps, then followed by one step. And if we have star, that just means there's some number of steps n greater than equal to zero. So we go from alpha to beta. And as we've talked about before, this relation, star relation, is reflexive transitive closure of our next configuration relation. Now, M accepts the string. If, if, we, if there's a transition from the initial configuration to some configuration where the state is the accept state. So it can be any configuration as long as we can get to the accept state. And M rejects a string. Similarly, we there's some transition from the start configuration to a configuration where we have 
the reject state. And so we'll say m halts on x if it either accepts or rejects x. That means it either enters the accept state or reject state. And we'll say m loops on x if it neither accepts nor rejects x. It just runs forever, never getting to the accept or reject state. And we'll say m is total if it halts in all inputs. And we'll let L of M be the set of strings accepted by M. And we will say a language is recursively enumerable, RE for short, if it is, if it is the language for some Turing machine. So Turing machines, in general, they accept recursively enumerable languages. And a language is recursive if it is the language for some total Turing machine. So total Turing machines accept recursive languages. So the recursively enumerable languages include the recursive languages, but not every recursive language is recursively enumerable. Okay, so let's look at a second example. This is much more interesting than our first example. This is a machine that accepts a non-context-free language a to the n, b to the n, c to the n, where n is greater than or equal to zero. I'm not actually going to give you the details of this machine, uh, but it has these uh, states, has a start state, then in addition has uh, 10 other states, and it has an accept and reject state. Its input alphabet is a, b, and c, and it has um, in addition to the input alphabet for its state alphabet, it has the left end marker. It also has a right end marker and it has a blank symbol. And you can find the details for this machine on page 212 of Dexter Cozen's book, Automata and Computability. Now, we can describe how this works, and I think you can be convinced we could actually write down a transition function that would make this machine work as described. So what M does, it's going to start at the leftmost symbol, the left end marker, and it's going to move to the right, and it's going to check that the input has the form A star, B star, C star. So it's going to make sure the first thing that it's going to be reading is an A, and it reads a bunch of A's, and it goes to reading a bunch of B's, and reading a bunch of C's, and finally it's going to end up with a blank symbol. It will overwrite that blank symbol with a right end marker. So that means it's going to have something here, and in here it's going to be a bunch of A's, a bunch of B's, and a bunch of C's. And then what it does, it scans back and forth. So it scans left and right between these two. And when um, each, each pass, it, it depends how we want to do it. We could just always go back here and start. It's going to erase a A, it will erase a B, and then it will erase a C. Go back here again, erase an A, erase a B, erase a C. It will continue doing that until there are no occurrences of A, B, and C to erase anymore. And in that case, it will accept. But if it turns out it, there isn't a symbol that, need, that can be erased, let's say it erased um, an A, and now there's no B to erase, then it will reject. So that's how this machine will work. OK, so we're going to stop here. And we'll continue um, next time looking at the differences between recursive and recursively enumerable sets.